uh, donated to the talk show this morning from Joe Kinzer's wife, Chastity. She was, uh, Joe was saying she was doing a wedding cake, right, yes. Joe? And then she had some leftover material. That's it. She's uh, making the wedding cake for my friend uh, who's getting married on the 30th. Uh-huh. And so, you know, she has to run through some, some trial runs, and that results in extra cake. So. Extra cake. Yeah. It is it looks Nothing good. better than extra cake. That's David, right. That's right? a pretty good first first run or, or trial run. Oh, oh, yeah. This isn't, I mean, you know, she does really beautiful wedding cakes. Is she this a baker? Is, yeah. Uh, well, on the side. Yeah, it's a, right, no just a passion of hers. Nice. So uh, this is, it has lemon and blueberry on the top. I've never seen that before. Yeah. Well, and that when I looked at it this morning, I said, who puts lemon on a cake? And she goes, you don't, you don't follow baking things on Instagram, do you? <laughs> no, honey. Very I, that's like a, I don't. Yeah. That's like a DiCarlo style cake. <laughs> Going back to my roots here. Next time, is it too much to ask to bring it in pre-sliced? You know, <laughs> <laughs> because sticking your hand in it and eating, it's just kind of, you know. That's true. That's true. You know, let me, let me speak for those of us who are, have the ability to slice our own cake. And by the way, this guy travels with a knife, so he has no trouble slicing a That's cake, true. by the way. That's true. Right? <laughs> but we are appreciative of the cake, sliced or not sliced. Chastity, thank you very much. Thank you. And we appreciate your latest trends on Instagram, even if your husband is ignorant of those trends. That's right. Yeah. Uh, Joe, you guys uh, had a big win recently. Yeah, last week, last Friday, we received a verdict on a really big case that's an important case for the office uh, for various reasons, but we're really proud of it. And um, it was a a cold case double homicide from Berkeley County. And this went back, what, seven years? Yes, 2016 is when the murders occurred. Yeah, can you refresh us with the facts of the case? Absolutely. So um, on... August 18th of 2016, uh, a young man was found murdered in Martinsburg behind, uh, well, yes, like in in downtown Martinsburg. And the investigation started there with Martinsburg City Police and the Detective Bureau, specifically Kevin Miller, who was a captain at the time for Martinsburg. And while they were investigating this young man, and he had been shot multiple times uh, in this alleyway, and when they notified they tried to find a family member to do the notification and and they did that and they're starting the investigation and that's when they're hearing from the family well we can't find his cousin either and so they were starting this investigation on a murder but they were also trying to figure out what happened to and the young man who was killed the first victim that was discovered was uh al Qadir sutton was his name and They were looking for his cousin as well amid Halfley, and it wasn't until the following morning that Berkeley County deputies discovered the body of amid Halfley outside of the city limits. It was actually, he was killed on, if you're thinking about like Shepherdstown Road, you're going towards Shepherdstown where there's the intersection with Greensburg Road there, Mm -hmm. like Faith Christian Academy. There were those sea containers that were there on the side of the road, like storage units, and he was, uh, his body was discovered there the following morning. And so... That murder happened in the county, so Berkeley County Sheriff's Office and the Criminal Investigations Division, they were investigating that homicide, but it was pretty apparent from the jump that they were related, and Martinsburg City had already really started the investigation from the night before and and ran with it. What was the big break in evidence on that? Sure. Well, you know, and that's, a lot of people have asked that question, like, what took so long? And I tell people... The investigators had a suspect within, you know, the first 48, you know, like they, they like to say, they had a, a suspect very early on, and that suspect was Derek Wayne Wells, the individual that we ultimately prosecuted for this. But what happened was, and, and there, was, there was some good evidence indicating that he was involved, but Matt can speak to this, I'm sure, you know, as prosecutors, you know, the state carries the burden of proof, and you can, you can think somebody did something, and even as an investigator or prosecutor, you can, in your heart of hearts, know that somebody did something. But it doesn't mean anything if you can't prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. And that's really what the, the problem and the issue that, that Captain Miller came across was he, he knew who did it very early on, for the most part. Uh, there, was, there was a lot of evidence indicating that Mr. Wells did this. But the big break came much later. So... Um, and I don't want to downplay any of the investigation because it, it was wonderful investigation on the front end, very thorough. But ultimately, Kevin Miller retired from the Martinsburg City Police. And I think, you know, at that time for the families, I think they just assumed 
you know, they they knew who had probably done it, but they were just not going to get justice, which nobody was really pleased with. But when he retired, when Kevin Miller retired from City PD, he came to our office as an investigator. And oh, I didn't know that. Yes, Kevin is our our investigator for the prosecutor's office. Uh, he's amazing, and when it, it was it was a lot of things coming together at the right time. One of them is his introduction to Dominic Orsini. Dom is an employee at our office who really defies labels. He's the office manager, felony coordinator. You can call him whatever you want, but he's vital to our office. And Dom took an incredible interest in this case. And he had been interested in it since 2016, since it happened. But when Kevin Miller came into the office and the two of those guys got together, uh, and then when Katie gave the green light for us to spend time and resources on cold cases with the, the, the cold case unit, um, everything just really came together. And Dom and Kevin reignited the investigation, uh, pulled jail phone calls. You know, you'd come in and Dom would just be sitting around a bunch of transcripts and listening to, to recorded jail calls from 2016. And he spent all of his free time doing that. And the big break came. There, there were two. One was that when we decided we were, okay, we were going to try to do something with this cold case officially, we brought in Jared Luciano from the Martinsburg City uh, Detective Bureau, and we brought in Lieutenant Bill Christian from the Sheriff's Office, and got them together in our office and said, hey, can you take the evidence that you all have in your evidence rooms and send it down to the lab and have the firearms evidence compared to each other. Let's see what the lab can tell us when they're looking at these things together. And that ended up showing that the same gun was used in both homicides. So like we knew that they were connected, but now we could prove that they were connected by the same exact murder weapon had killed both young men. And they also were able to tell us that the weapon that was used was a 40 caliber Glock. And we had already had evidence that we never did recover the murder weapon, but we had had we had evidence in the investigation that the defendant at that time suspect was known to have a 40 caliber Glock. That was the type of gun that he had at that time. So that was good. But then I tried the second half of the Taylor Hawkridge murder in early 2022. And part of that case involved the use of cell phone location data from cell towers. And I had used in both versions, there were two trials with that case, and both times I used a, a guy named uh, Special Agent Matthew Wild with the FBI Cellular Analysis Survey Team, CAST. So he was uh, amazing in those trials, and uh, I loved working with him, and I loved the science behind it and how effective it could be because they can just take your, they don't need the phone, they don't need to do a download of the phone, all they need are the records from AT&T, Verizon, Sprint. And those records hold enough data on them that they can show when calls or texts are happening on a phone, approximately where the phone is, the distance, you know, what tower it's pinging off of, what side of the tower it's pinging off of. And it's really, really helpful. So once I finished that trial in early 2022, I called Agent Wild and I said, hey, we've got this other case. We have phone records. Could you, we think that this might really break open the case. Can you look at it? And he said, I'd love to, but I'm getting transferred to South Carolina. Uh, so he ended up putting us in touch with a different FBI agent, John Orlando, out of the Pittsburgh office. And it's interesting that I don't know if you guys watch any of the court TV or any of that fun stuff, but Matthew Wild, when he went and was transferred to South Carolina, he was the cell phone guy from the FBI in the Alec Murdaugh trial that had all that damning evidence from his cell phone. That was, that was Agent uh, Wild. So, um, but Agent Orlando, who got our case, uh, was able to take, we had records from one of the victim's phones and from the defendant's phone. And when, what he was able to do by mapping out the defendant's locations for that day, it, it contradicted everything he said about where he was that day. And it eerily put him right on the path of both murders at the right time. Specifically, right behind Faith Christian Academy, there's a cell phone tower. And we had, officers had received these records quickly enough that we even had distance data from the towers. So 
you were able to see on paper, the jury was able to see ultimately last week, that the defendant and the victim's phones were both right next to Faith Christian Academy, right there at the murder scene at the time of the murder. Um, and I think that that ended up being ultimately the, the strongest evidence that we had proving this case. Matt? Joe, I'm going to ask you a question that, that you're not required to prove, but everybody asks is, what was the motive? That's right. Everybody thinks that we have to prove that, but we don't. Um, but the jury sure does like a motive. And our motive in this, it was determined, was that these gentlemen, both the victims and the defendant, they all knew each other. They were friends, actually. And w one of the things that they did though together is that they were all dealing drugs in Berkeley County at that time. And they were dealing drugs with another individual who was really the leader of, of that group. There were four individuals who were together. And when the leader got incarcerated for an unrelated matter in about a week or so, I think, before the murders. And ultimately, it, the motive was money. Uh, the leader was locked up and Mr. Wells eliminated the, the competition from within the group. And he took, it was pretty clear to us that he took both young men by surprise. They, uh, he picked them up at their residences, took them separately to these locations. And, you know, Mr. Sutton still had his cell phone in his hand when, you know, dead on the ground. So I don't think either of them saw it coming and it was just a surprise and it was a money grab. Where is Mr. Wells now? Well, right now he's at the Eastern Regional Jail awaiting his formal sentencing. The jury returned verdicts of guilty of two counts of first degree murder and guilty of two counts of use of a firearm in the commission of a felony. But when you have a conviction for first degree murder, the jury isn't done. Uh, we then have to ask them if they're going to attach mercy to the verdict. So if the, the penalty for first degree murder in West Virginia is life in prison, unless the jury attaches mer mercy to the verdict. And mercy just means that after 15 years, they're able to see the parole board. It doesn't mean they'll get paroled, but it means they have a chance. And so this jury did not attach mercy to the verdict. So we know he's not officially been sentenced yet, but we know from the decision of the jury that he will have two life sentences without the possibility of parole. Mr. Gilstrap, this is right up your alley. Yeah. I know, as one who writes crime fiction, right? Yeah. It's, it's Welcome to the world of research. Um, <laughs> in Berkeley County, what makes a cold case a cold case? How old does it have to be? There's no set time. It, it's just really for us, if there was a crime that was investigated by the original agency and it has not resulted in, in charges, and if we think we can lend something to that with our experience in the office, and then we'll do it. Was this uh, casting no aspersions? Congratulations on on all of it. Yeah. But it seems to me that that it, what is seven years after the fact, mm -hmm. it was primarily an issue of breaking down silos, getting people to share information, and was, was that a, a cultural thing that had to be overcome? Or? Sure, it always is in a case like this, and it certainly was here. We we also had evidence that the defendant's girlfriend had gotten rid of the gun for him afterward and when before officers even knew that within days after the murder they tried to go talk to her because she was girlfriends with the suspect they went to go talk to her she was gone she was gone as in she had gotten on a plane and moved to california and didn't come back just days after the murder and her mom didn't even know where she was which was suspicious so then we developed other evidence that perhaps she had assisted after the murder and ultimately, we tried to get a hold of her pre-indictment to talk to her and, and see if she would give a statement. Uh, she did not respond to our inquiries. So we had enough evidence and we indicted her for accessory after the fact to murder. We ended up picking her up in New Orleans and extraditing her back to West Virginia. And ultimately, she did agree and testify against uh, Mr. Wells, as well as that individual who was originally incarcerated that, that kind of set the stage for this to happen he he also testified on behalf of the state so you had mentioned that you accessed jail phone records yes whose jail phone records was mr wells in prison at one point he well he was but and and we got those calls and reviewed them but 
during this time when the the leader of the organization was incarcerated, he was talking to people, including the defendant, on a daily basis. What was really um, for a dramatic moment, I think, in the presentation of the case is the the gentleman who was in jail called the defendant five minutes after he murdered Amid Halfley. So it's an interesting thing that call's recorded. And so we're able to see on the map, thanks to the FBI, where he was five minutes after the murder that he was leaving out of town. When he got that call, we can listen to that phone call and the phone call itself is incredibly eerie. Uh, he is clearly out of breath. Um, he is acting strange to the point where the guy who's in jail goes, man, are you all right? And he says, yeah, I'm fine. You don't sound fine. Um, and it's because five minutes earlier, he surprised and ambushed his uh, friend and killed him. So it was, uh, yeah, that, that's primarily where we got the jail calls from, though, was the individual who was incarcerated at the time. You know, about uh, seven or eight years ago, I was a keynote speaker at the Virginia Homicide Investigators Association annual meeting. And it was a great time. Did you lead off with a joke? <laughs> you don't try. No, well, actually, I did. But, and I was kind of the, I was the luncheon entertainment. I wasn't the actual serious entertainment. Um, but I hung out with these guys for a few days. And what I found most important among, uh, most impressive about all these homicide investigators is they remember every case. And they remember the names for every case. And they remember the cases that haven't closed yet. Mm -hmm. So for the officers that are involved, whether retired or still active or whatever, this must be a really a high five moment oh, yeah. for everybody, yes. especially since they kind of knew who it was and they, they just couldn't put him away. Right. The level, like you said, these officers remember these things. They know these things. And especially when, you know, I, I feel very certain Kevin Miller knew 20, in 2016 who did this, but his the fact that he wasn't able at that time to prove it probably drove him nuts. He's been, uh, there's been a lot of high fives from Kevin Miller. And what was also great, even during the trial, after the trial is, well, I'll say during the trial, I, you know, I'd look back behind me and there's the entire Martinsburg city detective bureau, all those guys, you know, some of them weren't actually, yeah, most of them weren't detectives when this happened, but they were there, you know, they were there to show support and watch and, and there you know, were captains and lieutenants from the sheriff's office who were sitting in there showing their support, watching. And the group effort that this case took with our office and various law enforcement agencies, it's just, it's a great result. We're really I, proud. I presume that Mr. Wells pled or pleaded? Pl um, pled. Pled, not guilty. That's right. What was, what was his side of the story? What was his, because this sounds like it's, fairly good case yeah it is it is a it was a fairly good case we also had uh letters that he passed in the jail <laughs> to the to the co-defendant the the former girlfriend that were pretty damning um but the defense that they went with in this was that it was a circumstantial case that we didn't have any eyewitnesses who saw this individual commit the murders uh and that that was really it, you know, just holding, holding the state to its burden of proof, and can they really prove with just circumstantial evidence that this murder? Did happened. did they have an expert to counter the cell tone, cell phone tower uh, data? So they had retained experts for the gun evidence and experts for the cell phone tower, but I, I believe based upon the recommendations of their experts, I don't think they would have had beneficial testimony, so they were not called as witnesses. Joe Kinzer is our guest, assistant uh, prosecutor in the Berkeley County Prosecutor's Office and a candidate for the prosecuting attorney position in the next uh, election that's coming ahead. Mr. Wells remained in the area? In the area, yes. He actually, shortly after the murders, he got his federal parole revoked, so he went to federal prison again for a little stint. But then, ultimately, he was in the Martinsburg-Hagerstown area when we... Uh, apprehended him where is he likely to do uh whatever sentence he ultimately gets i would presume he'd be at mount olive correction mount olive uh was mari richards the police chief at that time in 2016 Ooh, time of the murder because you said kevin miller had preceded so. mari so if he was yeah. just the captain at that point then he would have no longer been chief and mari would have been right that, that i think, think so. was then mm -hmm. yeah that makes sense okay so how much cooperation was there between the county's offices and the cities in this situation oh yeah an immense amount of cooperation. Really, the Martinsburg City, because they had 
started the investigation and already talked to some of these family members and you know they were the ones that found out that mr halfley was missing before his body was found and you know they they did a lot of that legwork on the front end because they had rapport with the family and with the individuals that they were investigating but the support and collaboration you know it was all it took was a phone call over to to both agencies to get current representatives to come over and sit down with us and game plan how we're going to continue to dig into this and and have evidence analyzed and things like that it was it was wonderful are you free to say uh what the oldest cold case on file you folks are are considering opening or looking into is you don't have to say what it is if you don't want to but sure, just age sure. wise. it's i'm gonna say the one that we're really kind of focusing on now that that this one is finished and that we're trying to look at is from early 2000s i know yeah i'd say early 2000s are there any cold cases from like 1950 that you could go back to if you researched far enough? You know, if someone brings it to our attention and there's something that they think we can, you know, the advancements at the the crime lab, I mean, it's it's all the time. Technology is changing. And sometimes it just is a matter of someone saying, hey, why don't you look at this? Because otherwise, maybe evidence that could get tested just sits there. So let us know. Did you have a question, Matt, or, or John, I heard someone a moment ago. Um, any chance that Dom would go to law school and f- you know, fill I, a need? I thought that uh, – I think he thought about it for a while, but he's, he's just made himself uh, a, to a point right now that I don't, I don't think we can lose him. We can't, we can't lose Dom. We can't let him go to law school for too long. Is he related to all the other Orsinis in the area? He is. Yeah. Dana is his father, yes. who, who's probably been on the show for, for Rotary. Mm-hmm. Um, how – and this is a problem that both our offices have. Um, there's a, a sh- and this sounds like a good problem to have, but there's a shortage of lawyers. Yeah, right. <laughs> is, is that also the case in Berkeley County? It is, and you know we've tried to put our finger on it because it. I don't know what you think. To me, it makes no sense at all. This area is growing. It is the 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 gem of West Virginia as far as growth and expansion, and yet the lawyers coming to the area have seemingly dried up. And we can't find folks to um, to come over and work at the prosecutor's office. And and I know you have the same issue, and I know the public yeah. defender has the same issue. And um, I wonder if part of it has to do with when they switched judicial law clerks to full-time gigs instead of temporary gigs, because that used to be a funnel for young lawyers yes. into the area. They could come, and for a year or two, they could clerk for a judge. They could see how the sausage is made you know, behind the scenes. They could see what good lawyering is, what not so good lawyering is, and then go out on their own and leave the nest, and they don't do that anymore. I absolutely agree that that contributes to it, and the the barrier to entry into this area to move here, sure, um, I think is is probably hurting us. But I, I don't, you know, I didn't go to WVU Law School, so I don't know if they're graduating the same amount of attorneys. Sure. So I'm the uh, on the. West Virginia State Bar Board of Governors. I'm the representative for District 16, which is the Panhandle and Hardy, Hampshire, Mineral. It's the outer and, eight. Yes, yes, you got it. So in when we have our quarterly meetings, the dean is there and she gives a report. And so I'm, I'm aware that, um, you know, the bar passage nationally, it, it went down because of COVID. And in other places, it has bounced back. West Virginia's had not really bounced back yet. I'm interested to see at the next meeting what how this last uh, bar exam went. But I, I don't know. They just they act like everybody's got jobs. I, the the, the salary, starting salaries are really good. Up yes, here. money is not an issue in Berkeley County. I will tell you that. We don't need extra money. Uh, that's not the problem. Joe Kinzer, thank you very much. Great to see you again. Thank you. And hope a valuable lesson was learned here in solving this case. We employed no fewer than three Italians... Orlando, Luciano, and Orsini were involved in solving this case. And and a Pittsburgh connection. Let's not skimp on the Italians next time we're looking at investigating crime. Just saying. Never. Good job, Joe. Thank you. (laughs)